same thing. It's working now. Same zoom, same zoom. Yeah. Yes, and it works now like magic. Sometimes the only thing that works is a reset. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, okay, this is this is wonderful. Yes, and it works now like magic. Sometimes the only thing that works is a reset. <laughs> Yeah, Shashikant, uh, can you come live? Yes, I can. Am I? Super. So, uh, Shashi, take it away. Uh, three, two, one, and here we go. Okay. Good evening, friends. Uh, welcome back to yet another edition of uh, Gear Up Cafe. It's, it's great to have you guys here. Uh, India is always known for innovation, and this is our little innovative way to keep the community connected. Uh, gear up is um, a ripoff from what a pilot typically says when he builds up velocity to take off. The, at the tipping point of takeoff, he says gear up, and then that's the time when the flight takes off to the 35,000 feet altitude of flying that we all know. So, gear up is an initiative to help fellow professionals to come together, provide quality content, curate, innovate, collaborate with leaders from the HR fraternity and uh, uh, you know, uh, help the community have uh, an enriched, knowledge-shared, networked set of people around so that the future of HR is truly in place to keep this profession intact for centuries to come. So this is a small initiative from Siddharth, Naga Siddharth and myself. My name is Shashikan Jairaman. I come from Chennai. Naga Siddharth comes from Bengaluru, and here we are wanting to gear up with you for this session. And I would invite my co-founder, uh, Siddharth, to take it away from here and set the ball rolling for the session. Siddharth, over to you, please. Hey, Shashi. Uh, thanks, uh, as always, for that very energetic, uh, lovely, uh, uh, you know, taxiing down to the runway, as we can call it. Uh, hi, I'm Naga Siddharth. Uh, delighted to be here, co-founder of this uh, non-commercial initiative. We don't even call it a not for profit. We say non-commercial. So we don't have a we don't have a receipt book. We don't have any of that. You can't give us money, right? So uh, the focus here is absolutely on learning, on curating the best best ever content possible uh, as of now in the HR field. And the idea is that we care uh, for our fellow professionals. We are not trying to cure anyone here. We are definitely in it for pioneering innovation. As you know, we also run a psychometric uh, certificate, I mean, yeah, not really a certification program, but you can call it a learning program. Once a week, uh, we have more than 100 professionals who uh, regularly participate uh, in it every week. Today, I'm delighted and I'm really happy to welcome you to this uh, edition. We have none other than Mr. T. N. Hari. Uh, Hari, uh, <clears throat> known uh, as the head of HR of Big Basket, is a IIT IIM alumnus, and of course, he has uh, well over three uh, decades of experience. Uh, he's had both line and in his second uh, half of his career, uh, he's been a HR head uh, with multiple companies. Uh, he's almost that uh, HR head who seems to have a unicorn touch, right? So many of the companies that he's ever worked for uh, or is working for, uh, they've turned unicorn. And uh, Hari isn't uh, only a HR head. He also uh, you know, is an author. He's an educator. And uh, 
of course, a wonderful uh, senior and a mentor from the industry. Uh, we are indeed delighted to have him uh, on this uh, edition of Gear Up. Uh, he's been one of the top LinkedIn voices for three con uh, consecutive years. And a new a book of his is on the way. It's just in the ovens as of now. Uh, with those words, I, I very warmly and uh, I'm delighted again uh, to welcome you to this uh, edition of uh, Gear Up. Uh, we are ready to gear up with Hari Tien. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Siddharth and Shashi, for having me. It's a pleasure talking to a bunch of uh, HR professionals. So, the topic for me today is, uh, you know, saying no to Jugaad. And it'll be about making a big basket. And I think there are lessons that uh, all of us can take, uh, you know, to our respective companies, organizations, and even to our personal lives. So this is not going to be a eulogy of uh, Big Basket, which means that it will not be unconditional praise about how great this company is. This is a real company, real people, real flaws. I will talk about some of the good things. I'll talk about some of the you know, gaps that we've always had and how some of you could look at addressing those gaps in your organizations. People have also asked me once in a while, you know, what is this Jugaad about? Isn't Jugaad sometimes really good? is in Jugaad frugal innovation. So I think I've taken a slightly different perspective of the word Jugaad. So Jugaad is not really frugal innovation. Frugal innovation is good for organizations. It is good for everybody. You know, bootstrapping is good. Bootstrapping is the, you know, I would say necessity is the mother of invention. So similarly, bootstrapping, I think, brings out the creative juices in startups and young organizations and helps them to innovate in a frugal way. But that's not Jugaad. So I'll take a very broad perspective of Jugaad and talk to you, you know, through some real examples at uh, Big Basket on how we avoided doing the Jugaad. So for example, if you stick to your business model and not just go in for a different business model that is fashionable, that is also avoiding Jugaad because it demonstrates confidence in the business model that you have adopted. So with this, uh, let me just uh, straight away dive into some of the key aspects of the company. So, you know, if you remember Marshall Goldsmith's very famous uh, lines, like what got you here won't get you there. I think uh, it's equally important that if you forget who you are and what got you here, you will never get anywhere. So therefore, I think it's important to have wings, but at the same time, it's also important to be grounded and have a very strong foundation. In many ways, I think this is the sum and substance of Big Basket, which is remaining grounded, remaining very confident, in some basics. So I'll just uh, illustrate that with a couple of examples. Sometime in you know 2008, Flipkart was formed and uh, very quickly Tiger Global was an investor at Flipkart and Lee Fixel of Tiger you know, became pretty much a demigod for the e-commerce space in India. So Tiger ended up bankrolling almost the entire uh, e-commerce sector in India. And Lee Fixel was uh, in many ways uh, a highly feared, respected uh, personality. And the reason was because the day he invest, chose to invest in any startup, all the you know, competing startups were in for difficult times because they, he would so fund the startup, he would fund the startup so well and bring in deep pocketed investors that they could grow the company very rapidly through a process of discounts, cashbacks, and actually snatch all the customers from their rivals. So the rivals just couldn't be able to grow. That was the reputation with which uh, Leaf Excel came. And uh, sometime in 2015, sorry, 14 August, uh, Leaf Excel was supposed to be meeting the Big Basket founders. Big Basket was raising its next round. And uh, along with uh, Leaf Pixel came Kalyan Krishnamurti as well, who's currently the Flipkart of uh, CEO of Flipkart. And at that point of time, was also a partner at uh, Tiger Global. And uh, within less than 15 minutes of the meeting, uh, Lee Fixel, you know, tells the Big Basket founders, you know what, that your business model is not going to scale because it's so asset heavy. And we believe that asset light models are on their way and several asset light models are coming up in a big way and you guys are going to have competition. And the reason big, uh, was that uh, Big Basket chose to hold inventory. It chose to build its own warehouses. And that was the reason why it was asset heavy. Asset light really meant that you would position your delivery boys or pickers come delivery boys outside big bazaar stores or outside, you know, various other stores across the city. 
and you know based on customer orders they would walk into the store pick the order and then deliver it to a customer that was an asset light model and uh, the founders of big basket had learned from the previous avatar that grocery is a slightly difficult business and is not amenable to an asset light model for the simple reason that uh, you know if uh, you want 20 items of grocery from a st- online store and if the online store delivers 17 items to you then you would be forced to visit a physical store for the remaining 3 items and that is what you want to avoid so we answered the question very thoughtfully which is why does a customer want to shop with big basket because we answered that question very thoughtfully we did many of the right things i think this is a way of avoiding jugaad in many ways which is taking a shortcut which can get you growth in the short term but in the long term will not deliver consistent customer experience or consistent growth so that is the case of avoiding jugaad here and therefore you know if your customer needs to avoid a visit to the store it's important that uh, you know you supply everything that a customer wants for example if the customer wants fruits and vegetables and if the customer has to go out for fruits and vegetables because you only hold dry grocery this is a problem because they can order the dry grocery along with dry grocery sorry along with fruits and vegetables they can also buy the dry grocery from a physical store and the same thing therefore applied for children frozen items like ice creams meats uh, and all of that as a result of which we took the tough call of building the very wicked supply chains for fruits and vegetables as well as children frozen these are extremely wicked supply chains to build as a result of which most other online grocery players went down the path of just dry grocery But the point is you know customers want the complete basket dry grocery is not sufficient they want you know the children frozen as well as the fruits and vegetables so we built these two supply chains you know this is a subject for another day which is how do you build you know a supply chain for children frozen items and deliver ice creams and all the other stuff that needs to be you know maintained at very specific temperatures at the time of delivery to the customers how do you go ahead and build this on scale how do you ensure that the delivery boys don't do mix ups and we found that they were doing a lot of mix ups uh, so that life would become easy for them how did we figure all of this out how did we overcome all of this it was through a mixture of technology process audits all of that so number one start point about not going in for jugaad is avoiding the shortcut of going in for a marketplace based model for grocery and sticking to the belief that in grocery only a asset heavy model or an inventory led model where you own your own warehouses is what is going to work so that is a very critical aspect of of big basket i would say and uh, subsequently you know all the other grocery online grocery startups that uh, went down the path of you know building a satellite companies did not work out all of them actually fell along the wayside and died uh, grofers still survives but very quickly they had pivoted to uh, an asset heavy model like ours subsequently you know tiger went and funded uh, grofers when grofers was in an asset light mode they got soft bank also to fund grofers but grofers also very quickly pivoted to an asset heavy model so this is the first uh, thing about being very grounded and sticking to your point of view galileo you know felt that the earth went round the sun despite the pope as well as the church telling him that the sun went round the world to don't go with some wise thoughts or smart thoughts stick to your conventional belief that uh, the sun goes round the earth but i think galileo was very sure about it so if you are sure you know about something irrespective of who comes and tells you anything to the contrary is very important to be able to stick to your point of view this is about being grounded or having your foundation very strong and not just getting carried away in the wind and i also talked to you about you know we started with the question why does a customer shop with big basket and we answered that very thoughtfully and that helped us you know build the business in the right way and uh, trust me if you start with this question why not just for your organizations but in your own personal lives as well things will become much easier why are you doing something if you answer that question then i think uh, you will end up doing the right things in your journey both in life as well as in an organization there will be points when you will be completely confused there will be situations when you will not know what to do there will be situations where you will be faced with contradictory you know points of view 
or at one point you might find that the path is bifurcating or trifurcating and you don't know which you know fork to take but then if you answer the question why very thoughtfully picking the right fork or you know taking the right choice making the right choice taking the right decision in, at these points is going to be that much easier so i think that's very critical the next thing about uh, avoiding jugaad was you know we took the right culture which is we said that you know what we'll always do the right things right things by the employees right things by the customers and right things morally right things because even though they could push you back a little bit you know in the short term in the long term they always get you you know where you want to go they help you do the right things so for example our culture i think let me just spend some time on this a little bit because culture unfortunately is not something that a lot of people really understand you know all of us study different things in college we study you know engineering we might study computer science we might study hr we might study strategy you know financial analytics accounting and as you progress in an organization your understanding of each of these topics becomes much better the skills get honed and refined and you begin to you are able to contribute on these areas much better as you progress unfortunately in when it comes to culture i think we all remain 20 years down the road where we were when we started our careers which is that we don't understand what culture really is how to drive culture how does culture exactly impact business is something that many of us are not able to do so i think let me just take a minute to explain culture you know uh, i think all of you are reasonably familiar with game theory and game theory is a very powerful tool it can help you understand many things it can help you understand for example why traffic in bangalore is so chaotic whereas you know you go into singapore or boston or any other place in the western world you will find that even in the middle of the night when there is no cop around or when there is not much traffic when the traffic signal turns from green to red everyone would come to a standstill so why does that happen and why doesn't it happen in india so i think game theory can explain this game theory can explain a lot of other things as well it's a very very powerful tool if you choose to understand that a little bit so let me just use that to explain culture so for example take a real life situation where you have a day job to do and you also you know are entrusted or you you are uh, picked up to be a part of a cross functional team that is working on a company wide problem there are seven other individuals on the team you are the eighth individual the eight of you on that uh, you know cross functional team now you have a day job to do as well so you have a choice to make which is that will you take a free ride on that uh, cross functional project and hope that the remaining seven people work hard and make a success of that or will you say that you know what let me also contribute my bit even though my day job may suffer a little bit my you know okrs i may not completely meet or may not exceed my okrs but at least let me work hard in the functional cross functional project so choice you have to make now seven other individuals also can make the choice now let's take a 2 by 2 which is one of the most powerful tools that all mbas are aware about on the x axis you have two choices which is work hard in the project take a free ride in the project these are the two choices on the y axis you have other people have two choices everybody else which is they work hard on the project or they take a free ride now let's assume that you have to make a choice and let's assume that other people all the others choose to work hard on the project now you have two choices if you work hard on the project the project will succeed because anyway the other seven have chosen to work hard if you choose to take a free ride also in all likelihood it will succeed because seven others of the eight have chosen to work hard and if you take a free ride you can do your day job well you will get rewarded by your boss because you make the boss appear good you met your okrs you met your boss's okrs and you've been part of a successful cross functional project so you get all the best best of both the worlds so the automatic choice for you is take a free ride which is when others work hard you take a free ride now go to the other choice that people have which is they choose to take a free ride if they choose to take a free ride and you choose to work hard the project will fail if they take a free ride and you also take a free ride then also the project will play fail so it's best for you to again therefore take the choice of taking a free ride so any rational person from this example is bound to take a free ride right from this example it looks like every rational person is bound to take a free ride now as a result of which why do you think anybody would behave differently why would anybody ever work hard on some of these projects 
Now, just let's flip that a little bit and see what changes. Now, the same thing. You have let's apply the same thing again. Seven of them choose to work hard, and you take a free ride because that was the best rational choice. But if you take a free ride, your boss and the company are going to tell you you're a very bad corporate citizen because even though the project has succeeded, you have been a black sheep. There's no way we are going to promote you into leadership roles because leadership roles requires people of integrity, people who can go beyond their own self and contribute to the goodness of the organization. So if that is what they say, you will be working hard on this project. So you can take this to other exam situation where others take you know a free ride. Then if you work hard, the project fails. But if the company says that you're a great guy, you are a good corporate citizen, and you are the kind of a leader that we all need. So even though the project has failed, you are the one we'll pick for future leadership positions. If that's the stand management takes, then everybody would be working very hard on projects. So just see what changed from situation one to situation two. All that changed was what management and leadership chose to do, what kind of behaviors they chose to reward and recognize, what kind of behaviors they chose to penalize. So therefore, culture ultimately is about a set of behaviors that the company consistently recognizes and rewards, or a set of behaviors that they consistently discourage and penalize. As a result of which, you know, a thousand CEO speeches are useless. What really matters is demonstrated behavior. A thousand CEO speeches is worse than one demonstrated behavior. So people really don't care about what you say. You can say, for example, we have a policy of, you know, no sexual harassment. But and paste it on every meeting in every meeting room on the walls. But if your top salesman is accused of harassment, and if you you know sidestep that issue, or if you soft pedal on it, then people are going to know that irrespective of what your stated policy is, you actually don't care about it. So culture really reflects at three levels. One is artifacts. Artifacts will include, for example, how does your office look like? You know, does it have, you know, uh, closed doors? Does it have wooden panelings? Does it have glass? Do you have seated, uh, open seating arrangements? Does your head of HR sit outside or inside a cabin? Is it an open door? You know, can you look into what's happening? So I think that this is an artifact. Similarly, policies are also artifacts. A dress code is an artifact. Dress code does not indicate uh, anything about your company. You can be dressed very informally. You can be dressed very formally. But you cannot jump to a conclusion what culture is uh, this company having. The second you know, level of culture is about espoused values. Espoused values is what you put up everywhere. You know, customers are important for us. We focus on employee welfare. We do the right things by the employees. These are all espoused values. They don't mean that you respect or do whatever you are stating. They just are what you are stating about yourself and what you hope you could be. The third aspect of culture is really about the level at which culture manifests is really the informal, often unstated, the tacit, which is what I told you in the beginning, the behaviors that are rewarded, you know, the way people collaborate, the way the teams come together, that is real culture. The first two don't reflect culture at all. So let me just give you an example. At Big Basket, we have called out two elements of culture. One is actually four of them. I'll give you an example of two only. The first is a maniacal focus on customers. And the second is uh, speed and a sense of urgency in everything that we do. Maniacal focus on customers has percolated at all levels. Everyone in the company, right from the top to the bottom, demonstrate this focus on customers, a maniacal focus on customers, internal customers or external customers. But the second culture element, which is speed and a sense of urgency, has not percolated. Big Basket is not known as a company for being, uh, you know, agile, for taking quick decisions. We are a more thoughtful company. We would spend a lot of time sometimes going around in circles. We're not known for being fast and agile. And the reason why we are not known for fast and being fast and agile, but it's not percolated, is because it's not demonstrated. So that's the culture element that we've called out. It's something that we would like to be, but which we are not currently. So when we built these four elements of culture, we said we'll have three of them, which truly reflect who we already are. And one component of culture is something let's have as an aspiration, which is we should try and change and be what we state. So speed and a sense of urgency is an aspiration for us. It's not who we are naturally. It's not come to us. But focus on customers, maniacal focus, passion on customers is something that's come to us. 
Now, I'll also state interesting example of, you know, there's no good culture or bad culture. I think it's important to understand this. I think I, so. I'll give you a real example to show you this. So I'll take examples of two companies that I've worked for, and in both the cases, the cultures were different, and that translated to uh, different ways in which the company looked at talent. So at Big Basket, for example, the way we look at talent is we don't necessarily go to any of the top colleges. For example, we don't go to IITs, IIMs, and hire people. We don't even go to the uh, tier two. We don't go to NITs and hire people. And uh, the reason is because we are a you know low margin business. Grocery is an extremely low margin business, and to make a low margin business work, we have to take an approach to talent which is something very different from what a Flipkart or Ola would do. These companies would go like Google, Facebook to some of the top colleges on day one, day zero, pay very high salaries and pick a large number of them, pick many more than they sometimes really want. As a result of it, some of them are laying off in hundreds and thousands. So we took the call that we are not going to do this. We will pick people who can punch above their weight class. Our national supply chain head is a person who grew up in a village in Andhra Pradesh, studied in Telugu medium, graduated from a small Bufusil town about 30 kilometers from his village in Telugu medium again, and did very odd jobs, joined Big Basket, demonstrated his metal, and then he is now the national supply chain head at the age of 35. When he speaks English, you struggle to figure out what he's saying. His written communication on emails is bad. But then he's got such tremendous clarity of thought and ability to execute that it's just unbelievable. In this COVID crisis, he was the one who helped rejig all the processes in the warehouses to ensure that, you know, even with lesser manpower, we were able to meet, uh, you know, increased demand. So I think, uh, you know, he was a person who was able to do this. And there are several such examples at Big Basket. So ultimately, we realized that there are three, you know, levels of talent. The first skill that is often picked by companies is you know, clear thinking. Second one is execution, ability to execute. And last is communication. So these are three layers, three different orthogonal skills that companies look for. And we said that, you know what, each of these adds a layer of cost. So we said, you know what, we want everyone who can execute well. So that is non-negotiable. Then do we look for clear thinking? Yes, we said in corporate functions, everyone needs to have clear thinking ability. We said, well, you know what, in the regions, even if they don't have an ability to think clearly, it's okay because we will have corporate functions develop processes and they will execute, the regions will execute. And the, by backing up very ordinary people with great processes, we'll be able to get extraordinary performance every time. And then the third you know, layer of skill, which is communication, we said we don't care. In corporate or in the region, it doesn't matter how you communicate. So communication skills are absolutely not important. The way you speak, the way you structure your grammar, your sentences, it just doesn't matter. You can come with as very crude. You could have a very strong mother tongue accent. You could have grown up in a small, you know, Mufusil town village in India, from any part of India. But as long as you can execute well, think well, that's great. Because communication in India suddenly seems to add a huge layer of cost. Now, just come to a different example, Daksh. Other company that I worked for where the culture was very aggressive. Either you performed or perished. In Big Basket, if you don't perform, you'll be given one more opportunity. If you don't perform, you'll be given one more opportunity, but you are not going to be fired for non-performance. At Daksh, you'll be very quickly fired for non-performance. We picked people who were from the best you know, institutes. We believe that education pedigree is, you know, in many ways, a reflection of brain power. And we said we need people with, who could execute well and who could think well, who could communicate well. All skills were important because we had a great opportunity ahead of us in 2002. And we said we have to execute on the opportunity. So hire the best people, empower them, give them a lot of freedom. And if they don't perform, we're not going to spend too much time coaching them, teaching them because we don't have the time. So we let them go. So that was the culture at Daksh. Daksh was a very profitable business, extremely profitable business. So we could use that approach. So two very different approaches worked for two very different business contexts. So the point I'm trying to make here about culture is that it is very, very contextual. There's no right or wrong culture, but it's important to understand the culture of your company. Just as you know what, there is no right or wrong personality. All of us are different personalities. You know, all of us are meant to succeed in life, but uh, you know, you cannot be somebody else. But having said that, why is it important to know who you are as a person? 
if you cannot change, why is it important to know who you are? It's important because it helps create self-awareness. And self-awareness is such an important component of life's journey. And it will help you avoid the things that you're not good at, figure out you know, who you can hire to bring in those skills that you don't have. So self-awareness is a very, very powerful starting point, both as an individual as well as a company. Even if you cannot change who you are, you should know who you are. And that's the same thing about organizational culture as well. It is your signature for the company. So that's the point about culture. So I think at Big Basket, we chose to do the right things. We chose to, you know, like, for example, the sexual harassment policy, right? No jugad. We had situations where we had to fire two very senior people. In one case, one was a HR head for a region where it was important to have links with the, you know, I would say the toughs, the goons, the mafia, union leaders. Without them, it was impossible to do business in the region. And this HR head was very well connected with all these groups. And we thought, you know, we can't do business without him. But when there was an accusation and when we investigated in 24 hours and found it to be true, we let him go. And we took the call. We said, you know what, we'll deal with the situation. We also took the call when a very important function head was also accused of harassment. And that function was so critical for our growth that it was easy to have sidestepped that. But he said, we won't sidestep that because the damage that you will create in the long run is unbelievable. The short term advantage is that that function will scale and the company will scale. But in the long term, this will be known Big Basket as a terrible place, you know, for women to work. We'll never be able to hire women workers and even the men will start disrespecting the company. And disrespect is where you get killed. If people don't respect you as a company, deeply, deeply respect you, then you will struggle, you know. So it's not the right thing. So this is again a question of not, you know, saying no to Jukard, which is that we won't do things which are right in the short term, even though, though they are beneficial. We'll do things which are right in the long term, irrespective of what harm they may cause in the short term. Again, an example of Jugad and culture. I'll just quickly tell you a little bit about, uh, you know, our focus, which is that we've always been known, we've always said upfront, we are a retail company. We are not a tech company. We have said it upfront. Unlike, for example, you know, a WeWork, which pretended to be a tech company, got those, you know, $50 billion valuation, Morgan Stanley had said they could list them at $90 to $100 billion, and they are now bankrupt because they were always a real estate company. So it's important to be honest. So, you know, tech valuations are very high and Big Basket could have easily walked away by pretending to be a tech company. But, you know, we said we are not a tech company like Amazon and we are a retail company, which is that we just use technology to run a retail business. Just as Jet, you know, Airlines or Indigo Airlines or Lufthansa uses technology for booking it does not become a tech company. They continue to be airlines companies. Citibank continues to be a banking company, even though they use technology for uh, hundreds of online transactions. So we said we are a retail company. We will want valuation of retail companies because that is the only valuation that is sustainable. Because if you get tech valuations, then you, after some time, when people discover that you're a fraud, then your valuations will slide down. And that's not the right thing. So we've always said that we are a tech enabled company or not a tech first company. And therefore, the way we build the business as a result of this acknowledgement and understanding was very different. So because we were a tech enabled company, we said we are not going to do new things, which is that we will stick to grocery. That's what we understand. We'll stick to grocery. We might do a few adjacencies like kitchen, you know, equipment like, you know, pressure cookers, we will do. We might do beauty products, which are, you know, in a, in a, in an adjacent category. Uh, women buy beauty products, men buy beauty products, just as they buy groceries. And we can enter that category and we can leverage some of our knowledge and uh, you know supply chain capabilities. But we are not going to build an Amazon Web Services equivalent ever. And we are never going to acquire a company, payments company, for example. We will tie up with other companies for payments, for instance. We'll never acquire a payments. We'll never, never try to build our own you know, closed or open wallet. We have a closed wallet. We said we'll never build an open wallet by hiring a thousand tech folks. So because we knew we were a retail company, we did use technology to ensure that we delivered better retail customer experience using technology. So that was what we stuck to. I won't spend too much time. I'll just quickly take you through a few more things and then I, we can open it up. Just tell you about, you know, one or two things. One is uh, acquisitions. You know, when you're sitting on a pile of cash, you begin to hallucinate synergies that don't exist. And a lot of acquisitions, you know, are based on the belief that there are synergies. And synergies on paper look very attractive, but on the ground, 
they don't often materialize. That's the truth, real truth. So Snapdeal acquired Recharge for four hundred million dollars and eventually sold it off to Access Bank at sixty million dollars. And that's the case with so many other, you know, acquisitions where acquisitions were at large values because you were sitting on a pile of cash, didn't know what to do with it. And you thought, you know what, you could appear very cool if you're taking over companies at large valuations. You will be seen as, you know, growing and seen as building uh, capability and heft in the marketplace. But we said, you know what, we won't uh, acquire companies senselessly. We will acquire them very thoughtfully only if a startup can, you know, bring in a capability that we do not have, but which is essential for us to grow, we will acquire that. There has to be a terrific cultural fit or match between us and that startup. Only then will be acquired. And we will acquire the startup as much for the founders as for the business, which means that by acquiring Deliver, which was one of the first hyper-local companies in India, much before Swiggy or Zomato, but they were ahead, therefore they, they struggled in funding, uh, raising money after that. They were ahead of the times. When we acquired them, we also realized that we are acquiring three very intrepid entrepreneurs. And these entrepreneurs, we realized, can take Big Basket to the, a new height altogether, into a new orbit altogether. Because, you know, after some time, as you become bigger and bigger, that entrepreneurial energy starts getting diluted. And you need entrepreneurs to be able to build businesses even within large organizations. So when we acquired these three entrepreneurs, they helped us build new lines of business. So Afzal Salu, who you know, came from there, helped us build the express business. Praful and Rebu, you know, helped us with the entire Big Basket Daily business. Big Basket Daily is the fastest growing business and soon it will rival, you know, the traditional, you know, Big Basket full service delivery that we provided. So that's the power of bringing in very, very capable entrepreneurs who are aligned to your way of thinking, to your values, demonstrate the same integrity, the same passion. So we realize that bringing entrepreneurs on both acquisitions is as important as getting a business itself. So that was our philosophy towards acquisitions and that's how we've been acquiring all the startups that we acquired along the way. We're acquired based on these principles. The last thing I'd like to say is that we've always been a very frugal organization and uh, you know, we said that uh, in good times, you will tend to overspend. Good times, you will tend to cultivate bad habits. Good times, you will realize that as individuals, I don't care about learning. I don't care about developing new skills. Suddenly, when pink slips start getting handed out after a recession, we all run and try to acquire new skills, new, you know, learnings. But that's not the right time. It's actually the worst time to try and do new things. You try and cultivate good habits in good times when everything is going good for you. That's when you develop your strength of personality by cultivating these good habits. And these good habits are frugality. Good habits are continuous learning. Good habits are avoiding, you know, wasteful expenditure, thoughtless acquisitions, mindless hiring. You know, we've avoided all of that, which is again saying no to Jugaad, which is that like other companies, we could have also gone out to IITs and hired thousands of people and built a huge tech team. Our tech team is 200, including the product folks. You know, many other smaller companies have a thousand to two thousand people tech team. I am told that in one of the food delivery companies, there they had thousand people running a feature, a very very specific feature on surge pricing. So uh, sometimes you find it very shocking. But then you know when bad times hit you, you are then laying off these people because you hired them. And in fact, when you have hired such a large team, they don't even know what to do. They're sitting idle. Idle man's brain is a devil's workshop. So the point I'm making is that when it comes to this, the avoiding Jugard is cultivating good habits when they don't really seem to matter. In good times, please cultivate those good habits. You will wonder, you know, why should I cultivate good habits? But then they will come and stand you in good stead in bad times. That's the last point I'd like to make. And let me just summarize it by just reading one last para from my book, you know, saying no to do the make of big basket. Just one short para, it won't take more than 30 seconds. Life would be delightful and breathtaking story like if you seek endorse if you don't desperately seek endorsement or try to always fit in if you don't worry a lot about being judged and at the same time let others just be without judging them this holds true irrespective of whether you're an individual or a company in many ways this is the sum and substance of big basket so this is where i'd like to end and some of the principles you have figured out you know you can apply to 
as much in your personal lives, uh, in your careers, as much to the organizations that you work for. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Hari, uh, for that very, very smooth landing. And, uh, you know, it just, I mean, before we know the flight's over and we are back at, uh, you know, the terminal. So thank you for that. Uh, we do have a few questions that have come up. Uh, the first one is, uh, of course, there's a lot, uh, there, are, there are lots of comments just uh, applauding and celebrating the, the absolutely original uh, path of uh, thinking and, uh, you know, the, 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 the way of cultivating one's own identity, not really uh, listening to what's the market trend or what's what's so-called yeah. cool. And uh, there, there are a lot of comments on that. I let uh, Shashikant, uh, you know, do that. He does that very well. But one question here uh, is, uh, how does one effectively manage pilferage and wastage in this build, uh, in, in this business where uh, products have a variable shelf life? Pilferage uh, and what else is another one? Manage pilferage and, and, and wastage. Yeah, yeah. So that's that. So this is a very important metric for us, which is uh, pilferage is something called uh, IBND, invoiced but not delivered. This is an internal jargon that we use for pilferage. And the other is about, uh, you know, wastage, which we call dump, especially, you know, those with uh, short shelf life, like life, like fruits and vegetables. So for example, dump is tracked as a metric. So Big Basket is a very, very process review driven company. So we have metrics like, for example, fill rate should be 99.5% which means that every review, it has to be 99.5% fill rate. You know, out of stock should be less than 3%. Inventory holding should be seven days. IBND should be 0.1%. On-time delivery should be 99%. And uh, dump should be 0.5%. So we track these metrics very hard. So in any review, the metric, for example, on dump, it goes above 0.5%. There has to be an explanation why the dump went high. Why did the fruits and vegetables have to be dumped because they were not sold? Why did you order so much? What were the reasons? So all of this gets uh, discussed uh, in every review as a result of which we're able to track these. And some of it involves, you know, carrot and stick both. Both measures need, need to be taken. Uh, there are a few questions around, hey, uh, you know, this is very interesting. You don't fire people. It's, it's pretty much like a, a Indian uh, joint family where, you know, there's yeah. one or two guys who are just a little astray, but then you kind of bring them back to line, right? So what's the kind of a culturization that you use uh, to, uh, you know, really rewire a lot of uh, people you must be hiring from adjacent industries as well? Yeah, yeah. To, 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 uh, to that's, a, this. yeah. that's a very good question, which is that uh, is it, the broader question could really be when you are growing, you are hiring people from different industries. So how do you get them aligned to your culture and way of thinking? So I think in the whole interview process, part of the screening gets done. So for example, uh, even at uh, leadership levels, when we hire people from the best institutions like IIMs, we've got head of analytics, head of technology, very good education background. But a prerequisite is that they should be humble enough to work with people who are less privileged in terms of education. That's something we very, very explicitly look for. And in terms of you know not firing people, allowing them to stay, I think that's the way we are. So suppose I joined the company from a culture like Daksh where I came and I might have thought that, you know, a non-performer should be fired after giving one, one chance. I realized that, you know, the company is not firing. After some time, I will figure out that this is the company's culture. I better adapt to it. Very quickly, I begin to adapt. I'm not saying our culture is the best, you know. I'm not even saying hiring and firing, you know, firing underperformers, keeping underperformers, a choice. I'm not saying that either of them is really good or bad. It's just that, you know, it depends on the company's context. And the way I, the point, important point I'd like to make is that, you know, you cannot be perfect in everything. Like no individual also is perfect. But then, you know, Big Basket got two or three strategic choices correct. As a result of which it was able to disguise all the other weaknesses, which is the same point I make like every organization, they get two or three key strategic choices correct. Then they can afford to falter elsewhere and not really, you know, fall by the wayside. So our strategic choices were inventory led one. That was a very big strategic choice that we made. So similarly, tech enabled and not tech led. So some of these three, four strategic choices, we got them right. So everything else, you know, we could push under the carpet and didn't really hurt us. Lovely. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful answer. Uh, yeah, I think for every one question, I have 10, uh, uh, you know, uh, kudos okay. messages here on the live chat. Uh, and uh, 
Kono Subramaniam, uh, uh, who consults uh, extensively globally uh, in retail, has asked uh, you a question, Hari. Are there any standard uh, questions that you always ask when there is a tempting option to go for a shortcut or compromise? In short, is there a heuristic of questions that you ask uh, uh, or a filter that you have? Over to you. Yeah, the filter, uh, the most important question we ask is why? When we start with, when we solve a problem, solving a problem, and that problem could be anything. It could be about a policy. It could be about a product. It could be about anything. Why and what problem are we solving? I think we get clarity around these two. Once you get clarity around these two, I think uh, rest of the discussion about the how, what, everything else will automatically flow. But we spend time on getting the clarity on why and uh, what problem are we solving. Uh, and I can relate to that because uh, when you just joined this call, you asked uh, Shashikant and me, why are you doing this thing? Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, we, we've experienced that already from you. Yeah, uh, two, two other uh, very quick questions. We do have a lot of time. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, how did you effectively manage to keep the employee spirit, uh, the delivery, uh, the, the front line uh, up during the current uh, situation that uh, you know the country and the world is going through? I think you should see my LinkedIn post today. So that it precisely answers this question, which is that, you know, many of us have the luxury of working from home, but the nature of work for many others is such that they can't work from home. Our region teams cannot work from home. They need to be in the warehouses. They need to be on the roads. This post is about nine region business heads who are our field commanders, who are motivating the people on the ground, who are leading from the front. In the last three months, they have dealt with multiple U-turns, a large amount of uncertainty, volatility, stress, everything possible. And I cannot even begin to imagine how they handled all this and how are they motivating people to come to work in these difficult times. So I think it's really all about leadership, getting them to understand a higher sense of purpose, which is that you're not just delivering grocery, you're keeping the nation up and alive by providing essential services in these lockdown times. So I think, you know, this is the way soldiers feel motivated, you know, to go and fight, whether in, you know, Galwan Valley or Doklam. I think the same feeling that is what uh, get, will get people who are, you know, going out and doing grocery deliveries or are working in warehouses. And of course, you need to give them a lot of affection. You need to be standing along with them when they see officers along with them, soldiers give their best. I think that's those some of the very elementary man management principles of you know yesteryears are still very valid absolutely and people uh, have loyalty to the you know the their brigade you know when you ask some of them say that we are not fighting for india we are fighting for our leader that squadron pat you know the patrol head head of that uh, you know team that they're giving the life of that individual the same thing holds true here also they're you know going out and working for, you know, the team leader for that uh, store manager. Sure. Wonderful. Uh, there's uh, been, uh, there, there's one question uh, that someone's asked more on the operating side of uh, how do you create flexi manpower that lets you manage demand and supply? Yeah. So I think a uh, uh, good chunk of our delivery staff are micro entrepreneurs. Just as you know, you go to Swiggy, you take Ola, right? They're not employees of Ola, the drivers. Drivers are, you know, micro entrepreneurs. They have an app when, uh, you know, order comes, which is a, a ride. They may take the ride or they may not take the ride. So there are certain uh, constraints in which they operate, but they're not employees of the company. Uh, same principles apply here as well. Many of the delivery boys are not really employed. They're micro entrepreneurs. They get paid per order. So when uh, you know business goes up, we can get more and more of these, and we can get the same number of people to do more orders, and they get paid more. So that's a bit of a flexi model. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Hari. We know that you are writing, uh, or rather, you've written another book, uh, which is uh, getting, which is coming out uh, sometime in August. Uh, would you like to uh, spend maybe three minutes to give us a sneak preview of that? Yeah. So two books actually. One is titled, uh, you know, uh, from Pony to Unicorn. Scaling your startup sustainably. So this is about, you know, how a company should build a sustainable business. And we've tried to come out with a business model. And uh, we've tried to figure out, you know, what are the key elements of uh, scaling sustainably. 
we talked about that. We talked about you know the blind chase, blindly chasing valuations is not a great idea. How do you build your company up? We talked about the people component. We talked about making some strategic choices correct. We talked about why strategic execution is important. We talked about process, technology, cross audits, training. How all of them you know begin to create innovation in a company. So we've talked about all aspects of how do you build a large company. The second book is titled uh, you know sailing in a storm making a crisis work for you so in this covid crisis we also fig- i figured out that you know uh, this is a great opportunity to talk to people about crises in general not just the pandemic so using the pandemic as the background we talked of different crises we talked about crises in your personal life loss of a loved one how do you deal with it we talked about the 2008 crisis how some people fell and some people you know like uh, many others made the best of it so uh, for example warren buffett at the height of the crisis in 2008 actually invested 5 billion dollars in goldman sachs which was then a sinking company almost but then he made the right choice how did he make the best of a crisis so we talked of multiple examples we've taken examples from history to talk we talked of the kind of leaders that will pre- create an environment that actually prevents a crisis rather than create a crisis and then deal with it so we've taken a storytelling approach both from personal examples as well as from history to talk about uh, crises of different nature. Wow, and I'm sure uh, those are quite a few learnings from the real world that uh, you know, I'm sure most of us are waiting for. Uh, we had uh, questions from uh, Nitin Pandey, uh, Natesh Selvaraj and uh, Chandrika Naik, uh, whom I think the questions have been uh, answered directly or indirectly by you, but acknowledging them for the wonderful questions. Uh, over to you, uh, Shashi. Uh, do you have something to say? Well, uh, what do I say? It was a big basket of learning. All that I can say is that, and somewhere it resonates well. Uh, a lot of people here like the fact that you wanted to position yourself as a retail company and not a tech company, and uh, I think that's where the soul of, of of the initiatives come from. And we can relate to that because both Siddharth and I have been part of the retail industry in the past yeah, yeah, yeah. in our yes. careers. And yeah. it's so nice that we are able to impact a lot of people, uh, whether it is the micro entrepreneur uh, mode or it is yeah. uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, feet on street people or or the de- delivery people, whatnot, right? So uh, uh, you know, uh, it's 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 been great, and we really want to kind of take this forward. Uh, we have had uh, uh, over sixty plus participants asking questions here. It's not possible to answer all the questions. We'll try to. Uh, collect the questions and then respond to them over the WhatsApp group that we have. A WhatsApp group where we don't send forwards, but we use it for sharing questions and answering them and keeping them informed of the upcoming programs. So um, this was a session where there was um, uh, there was no hurry hurry because it was hurry at the helm and there was learning all the way. Thank you very much, Hari, once again. Thank you, Shashi. Thank you, Siddharth. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank On you. that note, uh, what one of the positives of COVID is that it has kind of, you know, we in HR generally do a lot of conferences and events and things like that, but there yeah. is very little that comes in terms of quality content. So mm-hmm. one of the things that's got excited, uh, uh, that's got Siddharth and I excited was the fact that you could connect brains from across the country. I'm from Chennai, yeah. Siddharth is from Bangalore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have yeah. people at least from uh, 12 different locations joining in. Yeah, yeah. So, Technology is a great leveler, and I'm happy that we are able to leverage that. Uh, I would yeah. like to take a leaf out of your uh, uh, statement that you know we are still a retail company, and technology is an enabler. So we would want to position GearUp as uh, a, a community that brews fresh content, served hot, piping hot for people with the help of technology. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. On on that note, I want to thank all the people who have raised their questions, all the people who kept the encomiums flowing. I can tell you there are three X uh, compliments to the number of questions that we had. I will ensure wow. I reach it out to you and I'm sure it will make your day. It certainly made so the day for much. all the participants. Make, make yes. me make my day. Thank you. Certainly, Harry. And uh, 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 as, as we go forward, uh, we will be coming out with uh, another session uh, next Friday. Until then, we have also reached out to you to ask if you have any time preference that you would want us to consider. We have a stream on uh, psychometrics uh, uh, wherein we take up psychometric assessments one per week and we ask respondents to uh, 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 fill it out and then the responses are collected and debriefing happens every Saturday morning from 11 a.m. to 12 noon. 
Now, this is happening with uh, uh, a very renowned psychometrician, Dr. Sorabi Prohit, who also happens to be uh, the daughter of uh, the late Dr. Uday Parikh, one of the founders, uh, founding fathers of HRD in India, along with Dr. T.V. Rao. So that's happening as a stream. And we have this as an initiative happening every Friday. We're also trying to see if there are any other uh, time that uh, we would we would uh, like people to uh, uh, like us to organize. We'll be happy to take feedback. Well, if you like this program, friends, please go tell the world this is a this is a non-commercial, priceless initiative that we're doing for the benefit of the HR community. We'll we'll be happy to get your colleagues, friends, your team members from your workplaces to be a part of this initiative. And if you think there is some feedback that we want to work. Chal Siddharth and I, we promise to work on that and make it a better experience for you next time. And uh, we also have this called the Gear Up channel on YouTube where we would in, we would invite you to come and uh, uh, you know subscribe so that you keep updated of all the content that we that we that we create for you. For you to know, this session that Hari has just addressed all of you will be live. Will be uh, it has been live till now. Will be posted on YouTube in about 10 minutes from now and available for the rest of the time online. Uh, on that note, uh, we will we will keep you informed. Uh, if you think uh, you would you would like to stay in touch with us, please give us your uh, exact email addresses. We will keep you informed of all our initiatives, and together let us join hands and make this HR fraternity a fantastic place for us and for the next generation to come in. Thank you very much. Thank Siddharth, you. Would you want to close? Yeah. Thank you very much. Once again, thank you to Hari. Uh, for uh, giving us his time and uh, making this a wonderful journey uh, on a Friday evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Siddharth. Thank you, Sushi. Thank you, Hari. Bye-bye, friends. Have a great weekend. Stay safe and stay spirited.